all of you that are listening, uh, those that are on Periscope, those that are in the cafe here in the sanctuary, we're continuing our study of the book of Matthew and are looking forward to it. How many of you have to commute to work more than a half hour a day? Okay, quite a few of you. How are the road, how's the, how are the drivers out there? Let me ask that question. Don't you just, how many commute 15 minutes to work? Or Yeah, okay, well, how are the drivers out there? I mean, it's crazy. It's ridiculous, isn't it? What some people do, have you ever asked yourself, what are they thinking? You ever ask yourself that? Have you ever said things while you were driving that you wish you hadn't said because you know it wasn't right? There was a story out here uh, by the, the jug handle. Richard DeMarco and I were stopped getting ready to go through the light. Dead stopped. I was driving, and I saw the truck behind us, not an 18-wheeler, but a pickup truck, had no intention of ever stopping at the light. And I saw this happening. I'm thinking, oh, he's going to, you know, hit his brakes hard when he gets to the light. He goes by us as fast as possible right through the red light. We thought, what in the world is going on? So if you commute to work, you've experienced uh, these things. If you have uh, lived in this area, you've experienced these things. When I first got out of Bible school, I lived in a town called Flemington, New Jersey. In Flemington, New Jersey, you know Flemington? You live there now? God bless you. That's a beautiful area. Uh, was, how long have you lived there? 15 years. Do you remember the big circle then before they made the changes? 1231 and all that? Well, I was from Ohio. Okay, I am from Ohio, but I was 21 years old when I got out of college and I was youth pastoring at Flemington Assembly right on Route 202. So I, it was the day before GPSs, so you had to get around based on people's instructions. And so I was trying to go somewhere, and someone said, you go to the circle, you go halfway around, and then you get off on, you know, Route 12 or whatever. Circle? What is, what is that? I had no idea what that, what that was. So I'm driving down, and uh, uh, at 21, I wasn't that experienced of an, a, dri a driver as it is. So I'm driving down, didn't understand this circle concept at all. And so what I did is I never stopped at any of the interchanges there. I just went into the circle as fast as I could, swerved to avoid people. People were coming in and all of that. I didn't know. I didn't know what was proper. And back in that day, there weren't yield signs Shortly after that, I don't know if it's because of me or not. I don't want to give myself too much credit. But shortly after that, they put yield signs so you would know when to yield to others. But back in the day when I first started driving on that circle, there, there were no yield signs. But the people from the area, they kind of had the unwritten rules of when to stop. Well, I wasn't informed of those unwritten rules. So going on those circles, there were three circles just in Flemington, New Jersey that you had to navigate your way through. But once they, it was interesting, once they put yield signs up, it made it much better for everyone, not just the local, but those that were out of town. It was the yield signs that made all of the difference. Then when I moved down here to, uh, to Malaga area, we used to have, before the jug handle, the triangle. What's it called? The triangle of death. It was the triangle of death. Do you remember that? I can't tell you how many times we were in our backyard and we would hear the brakes and we would hear the crash. Often, from motorcycles to cars to trucks, everything, no one could grasp the concept of yielding. And if people would just yield, it would have made it better. So they fixed it. They put in a jug handle. And down here, uh, people were saying, I don't know what a jug handle is. And when we give directions still, we say the jug handle, people, they don't know. But being from up north, we got the jug handle idea. But p when you come from the Wawa area and you're, you're coming over the bridge, let's say we're traveling like this, and you veer to the right, and that connects with Route 40, but people are going through the light. There's a yield sign there. But what I've experienced is that, you know, some people are colorblind, some people are legally blind, and some people are yield sign blind. That they don't see the yield. They're just going to go no matter who's there or no matter what's going on. 
One other place where there's a yield sign, when you come off of 55 on the Malaga exit, 39A, people are coming from the Elmer region on 40, and they have the right of way, and there's a yield sign. I can't tell you how many times people have pulled right out in front of me, or I stopped at the yield sign, but the people coming off 55 don't want me to stop at the yield sign. Do you understand? For some reason, yielding is such a difficult concept. Isn't it interesting, though, that in life, yielding is even harder than in driving? Because yielding involves getting away from our own desires and following what's best for everyone. See, yielding is difficult in our human nature from Adam and Eve all the way through to Randy Sabella. Yielding is a difficult concept in life because we want to be first. And some, I do the same thing. I'm an impatient person by nature. I come off the ramp, and I want to get to that spot before who's ever coming on Route 40 so that I can be first. I don't want anyone to interfere with my plans. I have to be somewhere at a certain time, and so I want to make sure that I go. Yielding sometimes involves stopping doing what we're doing, and we don't want to do that, but I think at the root of our human nature in life when we have to yield, it's so difficult because we don't want to relinquish control to anyone else. And that's really what Christianity boils down to. Are we willing to relinquish control of our own lives and give our lives over to Jesus? It's yielding. Adam and Eve didn't do it. But Jesus showed us how to yield. He yielded to the Father's plan. And we're going to look at a new character in the book of Matthew today. His name is John the Baptist, who understood how important it was for him to yield. Now we're in Matthew 5 or Matthew 3, I mean, verses 1 through 10. Matthew 3 verses 1 through 10. I'm going to read through them quickly. I'm going to break it down. We're going to make some application uh, from there. In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, "Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near." This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight the paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. He had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Okay? After the service today, I asked Jessica, and, and I asked her, are, are we going to have locusts and wild honey? Oh, no, the food's going to be much better than that. So you're, you are safe. Uh, safe today. But John the Baptist ate locusts and wild honey. But people went out to see him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of Jordan. Here's what that means from, from Vineland to the Tri-County area to all of South Jersey region. That's what that means. They came out to see him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children from Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So here's what we know about John the Baptist. He was a preacher. He was a baptizer. He was the one that prepared the way for Jesus. He pointed to someone above himself. It wasn't about him. It was about Jesus. He was an Old Testament prophet, like the last of the Old Testament prophets, when we think of Old Testament prophets, we often think of, you know, hellfire and brimstone, and, and that was part of it, de declaring judgment. And John was like that. He was declaring judgment on that generation and specifically the religious leaders of the time. We know he was a prophet like an Old Testament prophet. We know that he dressed funny and that he ate weird stuff, okay? But what the purpose of that was is that it was showing that John was no ordinary man. 
He had a specific calling on his life to be a prophet for God, just like Elijah. Do you know who else wore a a camel hair robe and ate locusts and honey? Elijah. And Elijah would be considered one of the greatest prophets in all of Israel, one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. Well, John was like him. John was fearless. He spoke to the most powerful religious leaders of the day and called them a brood of vipers. Told them judgment was coming. Told them that they needed to repent. Told them he didn't care what family they came from. The only thing that mattered was their relationship to God, not their relationship to Abraham. He was fierce. He was fearless. But John understood something important. He understood the importance of of yielding, of yielding. So John was the fulfillment of all of these prophecies about him. He preached repentance. He wore weird clothes. People all over the region were coming to see him, probably thousands and thousands of people. John's ministry was causing quite a stir. Some people loved him because he was preaching the word of God. The religious leaders hated him because he wasn't speaking the way they would want him to speak. Oftentimes, it's the religious folk that have the most problems with what God is doing because the religious people put God in this box and think that he should do things. Watch. God should do things our way. God should do things the way we would do things. God should do things like this and not like that. And if it doesn't fit into our little box of who God is, then we reject it as if it's not God. That's what the religious leaders were doing. Well, surely John can't be a man of God. He's uneducated. And look how educated we are. He's poor. And look how wealthy we are. He speaks about the Old Testament as if it's literal. We know better. See, all of these things, but John was uh, a man of God. People were coming by the thousands, and they were being baptized in the Jordan River. So the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they had to find out what was going on. And not only was he uh, fearless, but he, looked, he was willing to put that into action. He looked at them and said, you brood of vipers. Now, that's pretty serious. I wouldn't begin, like, your conversation around the table afterwards. That's not a good conversation starter. So you get your plate of food. You fill it up. In your mind, you wish you had two plates because you didn't really get as much as you wanted to get. I'm sorry. Maybe that's just me. Let me skip that. But you bring your plate over to the table and you sit down with maybe somebody you don't know, maybe family that you do know. Probably the best way not to start your conversation is, hey, what's up, you brood of vipers? Hey, that's not going to bring a lot of friends your side. But John wasn't concerned with his popularity. He was concerned with preaching the, the gospel. And here were these religious leaders that were supposed to be leading people towards God, and in actuality, they were leading people away from God. And he said, you guys are so bad that whatever you speak is like poison. It's like poison. And when it gets into people's system, it actually kills them instead of bringing life. And God is a God of life. You brood of vipers. Wrath is coming upon you. See, they hadn't come to repent. They hadn't come to offer their lives to God. They haven't come to change their ways. The religious leaders of the day didn't come to yield to God. See, they came to control what God was doing. But God can't be controlled. And John the Baptist couldn't be controlled. So they said, well, we're from from, uh, Abraham. John says, your family that you came from doesn't, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Someday, Lord willing, Adelaide and, and Everett will look back on the pictures. They probably won't remember what, what happened today. The parents will always remember. The grandparents will always remember. The friends and family will remember because we're old enough to remember. They won't always remember. But Everett and Adelaide, just like the rest of us, someday are going to have to accept Jesus on their own. Today, what happened today was awesome. It's a starting point. 
what we're saying, what, what, what uh, Bobby and Jessica were saying, we want our children to, to start on the right track. And we want to head them in the right direction. That's, that's what they were saying. How awesome is that? Out of all that could be going on in, in our lives, they took a Sunday morning when it was pouring down rain to say, you know what? Our children, we want them to start off in the right direction. Awesome. Awesome. But someday as they get older, the children get older, they're going to have to make a decision for themselves and they're not going to be able to say, well, I was dedicated when I was three, when I was one. No, it's a starting point. It's not the finish line. They're not going to be able to say, well, my family knew the Lord. My parents knew the Lord. My grand And the same with us. For me, they grew up in church. I'm the fourth, fourth generation of Pentecostals, fourth generation of Pentecostal preachers. At some point in my life, I had to say, you know what? My parents' salvation is not going to work for me. I have to accept the Lord. My parents were godly people. Or my mother's still a godly person. My grandparents were godly people. They came over for, from Italy, accepted the Lord. I mean, just a great transformation took place in their lives. But I, I, when I stand before God, I can't say, well, you know, God, my grandfather was a Christian. He was a strong Christian man. The, the response is going to be something like this. Well, what about you? Well, God, I know my grandparents, that's going back. But my parents, oh, they were godly, saintly people. But at some point, the question's going to be asked, well, what about what about you? That's really what John was doing because, because the religious leader said, we're okay with God because of Abraham. Because of thousands of years ago, because we were born into the right family, then everything's going to be all right between us and God. John was saying, nope, it doesn't matter what family you were born into. What matters is, are you born again? Are you born again by the Spirit of God? Are you transformed by his life-giving power? That's what matters. Well, how do I get born again? How do I enter into this new life with God? Well, first of all, you have to yield. Whoops. You have to yield your way to his. I'm not one of those yielding guys. I'm not one of those yielding people. I want God to accept my way. I want God to just do it my way, and then maybe I'll go along with what God has to say. See? No, at some point, we all have to come to that point where we yield to his plan. Can I just tell you the end of the end of the story before I get there? His way is better than my way. His way is better than my way. I hate stopping at red lights. Can I tell you another driving story? When you're going to the mall, the Cumberland Mall, and you get off 55, and I don't know what exit it is, but you come to that exit, and you get off, and you go to that light, and if you veer to the right, you head to those, like, Lowe's, and my car, I don't know why, but it heads right to Kohl's. I don't know, because it's not, nobody got that joke? Anyway, okay. Heads right, no? Am I okay? But you get to that... <laughs> You get to that light there. Do you know where I'm talking about? One veers this way, but you still have to yield. The light there to go to the mall to the left and also to Arby's. Arby's is also to the left. Oh, Chick-fil-A too. And Taco Bell. These are a few of my favorite things, okay? But if you, if you get that light and like when you're getting off the exit and it just turns red, you might as well pack it in because you got another 10 minutes while you're waiting. That's the truth. I don't like red lights. But here's the issue. If it wasn't for the yield and it wasn't for the stoplight, how many lives would be lost? It's the same in our lives as it relates to God. We don't want to stop. We don't want to yield. We want to do our own thing, but how many lives are lost because we refuse to stop or yield to the things of God? See? So here we have John the Baptist. He was hugely popular. He was a powerful prophet, preached repentance. Thousands came to see him. Thousands were baptized. In our day, he could have had a TV show. He could have been on 24-hour news debating people, and not just debating people, but winning those debates. 
His best moments would air on YouTube. People would click on them and watch them by the millions. His website would have millions of hits. His Facebook would eventually have had to cut off the number of friends because he had more than what Facebook could handle. Twitter wasn't enough to handle his sermons because 120 words or 240 words weren't enough to fully portray what was going on. John would have been huge in our day. But there was something about John that was different. And there was two things he knew. He knew who he was and he knew who he wasn't. He knew that he was a prophet sent to come before the Messiah, but he also knew he wasn't the Messiah. And see, he wasn't into the publicity and the promotion that goes along with it. Instead, he was into pointing people to the one that would come after him. So watch the next verse. It says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I. He's pointing to someone after him whose sandals I'm not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. This one that's coming after me has a winnowing fork in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into his barn and the burning of the chaff with the unquenchable fire. There was one coming that was more powerful than John, and his name was Jesus. And the very next verse After John talks about Jesus in verse 13, the very next verse is, then Jesus came. He came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But watch what John does in verse 14. But John tried to deter him, saying he understood who Jesus was. He understood that Jesus was the Messiah. He understood the power, the magnificence, and the majesty of Jesus. He said, I need to be baptized by you. And yet you, Jesus, come to me, and Jesus replied, verse 15, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And if you see it, if you're reading along, here's what it says. Then John consented, but our word today is different. Then John what? Yielded. Then John yielded to one greater than himself. Someone greater had come, someone who was above John, someone who knew what John didn't know, someone that could do what John couldn't do. And when we have this understanding of who Jesus is and who we are, what we're called to do and what we're not called to do, who we are and who we're not, when we have this understanding of who Jesus is, it makes it easier to yield See, I can look back on my life and see the mistakes that I've made and the choices that I've made that have been wrong. And you know, at every part, because I was privileged to grow up in church, at every part, every decision that I made looking back on it is because I refused to yield to the one that knew better than I did. It's because I wanted my own will and my own way. I wanted to do what I wanted to do, not what he wanted me to do. Now, by his grace, he accepts us. And he gives us new life and a new purpose and a new vision and a new destiny. But John willingly yielded because he understood that Jesus was greater than he was. We too can yield when we understand that Jesus is greater than we are. But because John was willing to yield, here's what Jesus said about John. John was hugely popular and he gave it all up. We see that his ministry changed in that we don't hear about the thousands of people that are coming to John anymore. Instead, it's Jesus feeding 5,000 men, probably fifteen to 20,000 people. It's Jesus performing the miracles. It's not John. But Jesus says this about John, I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Jesus said of John the Baptist, no one that's ever been born is greater than John the Baptist. Why? because he learned to yield. He yielded to the known will of God. Now, what does all this mean to us today? We must yield our will to God's if we're going to be all that God wants us to be. That's all. This whole series on the book of Matthew, I've been teaching it on Wednesday nights for almost three years now. And so to boil down these Sunday mornings into a half hour has been difficult for me. But in all of these passages, chapter 1, 2, 3, next week, 
uh, we'll look at how Jesus yielded his own desires to the word of God when he was tempted. The theme of this first part in our series so far has been yielding, yielding. We must yield to God. We must relinquish the control of our own lives and give it over to God in order for us to be all God wants us to be. We cannot have a right relationship with God without yielding. The Bible might call it repenting. We cannot have a, the life God wants us to have without yielding. Often, we have to yield for the benefit of the kingdom of God. One commentator writes this, and I'll close. Put yourself in John's shoes. Your work is going well. People are taking notice. Everything is growing. The ministry is just growing exponentially. But you know that the purpose of your work is to prepare the people for Jesus. Then Jesus arrives, and his coming tests your integrity. Will you be able to turn your followers over to him? John passed the test publicly by baptizing Jesus. Here's what happened. He sees Jesus coming. John says, I'm not even worthy to untie your sandals. I'm not even worthy to do the lowest servant's job. Jesus says, I must be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. John the Baptist says, yields. He consents and says, I will baptize you. It was at that moment that he baptized Jesus that he yielded his life completely to Jesus. That he gave everything that he was and everything that he had, he gave over to the life of Jesus. John passed the test publicly because he could have said, I yield to Jesus and kept doing his own thing. But he showed that he yielded. Let me keep going. Soon he would say, he must become greater and I must become less. We know it as Jesus must increase and I must decrease. Can you, like John, put your ego and profitable work aside in order to point others to Jesus? Are you willing to lose some of your status so that everyone will benefit? Are we willing to yield? When I talk about yielding, I've given you funny stories of driving because I have trouble yielding when I'm driving too. I talk about yielding spiritually because I have trouble yielding too. There are times where I know what God wants me to do and I, and I fight against it. Thankfully, he doesn't give up on me. He keeps putting it in my heart, putting it in my heart. And when I yield, all the, watch, all the fears that I had before I yielded, like, well, God, if I do that, then I'm not going to be in control. God, if I do that, I don't know what tomorrow holds. God, if I do that, I don't know what the future holds. All of those fears, when I finally yield, he replaces those fears with peace. Because when I yield to him, I say, God, you're in charge of everything. And something happens in my heart that I can't make happen when I try to stay in control of everything. It's yielding. Lord, I turn it over to you. And then God works. I, I have to tell you this, and I really have to close. And I just forgot what I was going to say, and it was really good. I hate when that happens. Last time that happened, I didn't get it till 2 o'clock that afternoon. We were eating, done eating, getting ready to take my spiritual nap. And a spiritual nap is just like a, a regular nap, but it, I call it a spiritual or Pentecostal nap. About 2 o'clock, it hit me. I was like, oh, that was the point. Man, it was good. So I'm talking now to try to get the point back in my head. Uh, it's still not coming. So I'll close. <laughs> what areas of life are we having trouble yielding to? Let me encourage you today to let go, to surrender, and to yield because he's greater than we are. He's greater than we are, and he will give you peace when you surrender to him. And all God's people said, amen. amen.